Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. gruesome games, like sitting in the dark and answering the question, what's the most horrible thing you can imagine happening to you? The answer usually involved werewolves, vampires, ghouls, and the like, but I've never found such things real enough to be frightening. I believe the question should be rephrased, what's the most horrible thing that could really happen to you? But they're going to kill me. Well, I can't help you. I've got nothing to work with. But you're, you're supposed to be a lawyer. <laughs> I'm not a magician, so... You're just going to let them electrocute me? I'm innocent. Can't you understand that? I'm innocent. Not anymore. What do you mean, not anymore? I mean legally. That's the law, Joe, remember? Innocent until proven guilty. But I'm not really guilty. Where's the proof? Proof is nine points of the law. And on your side, Joe, you don't even have one point of proof. <laughs> drama, The Victim, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bryce Walton and stars John Lithgow. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is my idea of genuine horror. To be somehow proven guilty of murder when you are not. To be locked away in a cold cell alone, friendless, helpless, waiting to die. How many innocent people have been executed for crimes they never committed? How can such rank injustice happen? Here is how it happened to one man. Here is his story in his own words, as it appeared in the morning sun times. I'm Joe Thompson. In the headlines now, my picture in the papers and magazines. But before that Monday night, when my nightmare began... I was Mr. Nobody, going nowhere but on over the hill to the wrong side of 40. Old Joe Average, divorced, lonely, average height, average build, average paunch, and the kind of face you'd forget even while you were looking at it. I'd killed another evening in a restaurant and bar, got home around 12.30 that night. Home. <laughs> One room with a pull-down bed, a closet-sized kitchen, and a television set that wasn't mine. I'd popped another can of brew and was semi-conscious in front of the TV, and there was a knock at the door. Is this any way to greet a visitor? What way? What do you mean? I mean, half-dressed, hair all messed up. <laughs> Well, you haven't even taken yourself a shave. I wasn't planning on having company. Well, I wouldn't have planned on it either. If I was you, I wouldn't even be at home. So you should have called first. Thank you. Hey, what's the idea? I'm uh, not a fan of early John Wayne. Nothing funny now. Just uh, stand against the wall, nice and easy. Hey, what are you doing? Risking you for concealed weapons, remember? <sighs> That's no weapon. That's my wallet. <laughs> so keep it. It's empty. This whole scene's empty. Nothing worth taking out of here unless you collect old TV sets. Go ahead, take it. But you'll also have to pick up the payments. Uh-huh. Hold on to your sense of humor, pal. You'll need it. Hey, what are you doing? Handcuffs. Uh, you... that, 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 that resisting an officer won't help your case either. What case? I'll ask the questions. So who's asking? Oh, excuse my rudeness. I'm Sergeant Crow. My partner, Officer Wilson, is waiting for us downstairs. Sergeant... Look, you can see in my wallet there, I'm Joe Thompson. You've made some kind of mistake. You made the mistake, Thompson. Hey, you know, why throw my clothes around? Well, wait, I've got some rights here. You're a cop. Show me some identity. 
You barge in here. Don't tell me anything. Handcuff me, tear my clothes apart, break things. What about the search warrant? I've got right. Well, didn't you invite me in, Thompson? I sure didn't. I say you did. Well, you're wrong. I didn't. Oh, I apologize for disturbing your elegant wardrobe, but I got... Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, here they are. You'll need the raincoat and hat. What for? We're going out, Thompson. You have an appointment. But it isn't raining. We'll take the raincoat and hat anyway. Just in case. Oh, let's, let's, go. Not, let's go. Go where? Why should I go anywhere? We're going downtown, Thompson. Police headquarters, Central Station. Where you uh, set up the appointment. <sighs> I didn't set up any appointment there. Sure you did. You set it up last Saturday night. I don't know what you're talking about. I tell you, you got the wrong man. Then why do you object to cooperating with the police? Where's your civic spirit? Civic spirit? Well, that's a laugh. Oh, no. Now, simmer down, Thompson. If you're innocent, you can't object to answering a few questions. About what? Hey, this is no place for a serious discussion. We have a place all set up for that downtown. A special private room just for answering questions. <laughs> How long have you lived here in Palm City, Mr. Thompson? About six months. You married? I was, but my wife thought better of it. You're adrift. I wouldn't say that. Well, how would you classify yourself, then? You don't seem to spend very long in one location. I'm a carpenter, sir. That's my line of work. And hasn't a great deal of your work consisted in standing in unemployment lines? I've put in my time there, yes. But I've got a job now at Larson's Building Supplies on South Street. You're a carpenter there. Well, I'm getting close. Work in the lumber yard. Were you working there last Saturday? Yeah, that's the big day at Larson's. How late did you work Saturday? Until six. And what did you do after that? Why, well, mostly I, I guess I just drove around. Oh, just drove around? Yeah, I do that a lot. Just doesn't seem to be much else to Cruising? do. Cruising? I wouldn't say that. Just driving, you know, killing time. Killing time? Lonely, in a new town, not knowing anyone much. Do you drive around looking for company? Maybe. It's always a possibility. Uh, but did you also kill some time in the Shamrock Bar? Sure, I dropped in there for a few. To pick up some company? Well, it could happen. But mostly I just... Uh, what time were you cruising the Shamrock Bar? I don't know exactly. Like I said, I, I was there to kill time. Not count it. I had a few... My memory's on the hazy side. When did you get home from the Shamrock Bar? Maybe around 2 a.m. This raincoat and hat, Thompson, they're yours? Yes, they are. You went to the Shamrock Bar, then home, huh? Oh, where did you get all this mud on your raincoat and hat? Mud? Yeah, this reddish clay mud smeared all over. Where did you pick that up, and when? I guess I don't... Uh, wait, yes, uh, I remember now. I, I had a flat tire. Sure, it's all coming back to me. A blowout. Mm -hmm. Had to change uh, a flat there off the road. Oh, uh, off the road? Where? Uh, along Jensen Drive somewhere, I think. It, it was dark, and I, I couldn't... Well, if you can't remember where this uh, suddenly remembered convenient flat occurred, maybe you can tell us when. I, I, I can't. No, I, I can't. Not exactly. Oh, well, can you remember if it was after or before you cruised the Shamrock Bar? After, I think. Mm hmm And when do you think? Uh, I think maybe around midnight. You are Benny Schaff? For 66 years, sir. Your occupation, please. Bartender at the Shamrock. Since the end of World War II. Uh, is this man, Mr. Thompson, one of your customers, huh? Him? Oh, sure. He's in here every Saturday night. That's his name, Thompson? He was at your bar last Saturday night. That's right. Leaning over the end there. Uh, was he wearing this raincoat and hat? Yeah. Was the raincoat and hat smeared with this uh, reddish clay mud? Not that I remember. No, sir. Well, when did Thompson come into the shamrock? About... 9.30, I'd say. Uh -huh. When did he leave? Maybe a little after midnight. And was the girl Dorothy Logan at the Shamrock Bar Saturday night? Yeah, she was. She's there just about every night. And what time did she leave? Around midnight. Now, Thompson, 
Do you remember following Dorothy Logan out of the Shamrock Bar a little after midnight Saturday? I told you, no. I, I never knew any Dorothy Logan. Small, slender, 18 years old, dark brown hair, red sweater. You knew her such a short time, maybe you just didn't get around to her name. I didn't get around to her at all. I never saw her. I, I never followed any woman out of the Shamrock Bar. I was always careful who followed me out. <laughs> Are you taking me now? Yeah, just down the hall here, Thompson. We have a little uh, theater set up down here for our guests. Little theater? All right. For bad actors. <laughs> You've got to fill me in. What am I supposed to have done? You can tell me that much. I can tell you what you'd better do. Call yourself a lawyer. Why? Why do I need a lawyer? Mm, you guys are weird. All sound alike. Who? Me? I never did nothing. I'm clean. A lot of you. Innocent as babes. Some of you really think you are innocent. <laughs> and so it's really weird. I'm not weird. I am innocent. Uh, here we are, Thompson. Now, just step up here between these two gentlemen. That's right. What is this? You're on stage, pal. Let's say you're uh, trying out for a part. And if you get it, you'll be a star performer. <laughs> now, just uh, stand up here, straight and natural. Uh, it's a ticket. Now, Miss Travis, please look at the men lined up there. Now, you look at them, study them very carefully. Now, take your time. Now, do you recognize any of them? I'd rather not, but I do. Well, have you seen one of these men before? I sure have. But what I saw wasn't a man, it was an animal. Uh, would you point out the, the uh, man you recognize? That one... Second from the right there. Ah, uh, you have seen him before. Yes. But what if I hadn't? Look at him. Anybody would know on first sight he was an animal. Where and when did you see this man? In Jonathan's Grove last Saturday night. Uh, no, actually it was early Sunday morning. Now, are you certain? Now, you must be absolutely certain, Miss Travis, that this is the man you saw. I'm certain, all right. You ever forget how a skunk smells? He's the one. He's the killer. I'm sure you've noted the fact that all men are mortal. This is most fortunate, at least for mystery stories, where anyone can be a victim, don't you see? Which is perhaps as it should be in a democracy. For example, anyone at all may be robbed, mugged, murdered, or falsely arrested. It is just a matter of waiting one's turn. Or is it? Joe's story of persecution sounds straightforward and believable enough. Perhaps we should clear up some disturbing contradictions in Act Two. Joe Thompson's continuing story of persecution as it appeared in the morning sometimes rings with undeniable conviction. Joe's been there. He's experienced the nightmare. Joe knows firsthand the depths of terror the terror of a small and innocent man found guilty of a murder. He's telling it like it is. We believe him. Of course we believe him. But I'm reminded of an old English legend. I know not what the truth may be. I tell the tale as to told to me. <laughs> if I kept telling them the truth, what else could I tell them but the truth? But nobody believed me. Nobody even bothered to listen. Nobody cared. I was presumed guilty of murder. And who cares about murderers anymore, right? Let's care more about the victims, right? Sure, fine. That's just dandy. I'm on the side of the victim. But I was the victim. They couldn't see that, though. All they could see was Dorothy Logan and the need to nail somebody... To the wall. You followed Dorothy Logan out of the Shamrock Bar Saturday night or early Sunday morning. Now you lured her into your car, drove her into Jonathan's Grove and back of the tavern. She resisted your advances and you killed her. You strangled her with those powerful carpenter's hands. No, I didn't do that. I couldn't we have... Oh, you're guilty, Thompson. Now confess. Tell us the truth. 
Make it easier for yourself and for all of us. But I'm telling the truth. I never knew any Dorothy Logan. Never saw her. Never followed her. Never followed anybody. I sure never killed anybody. Evidence, witnesses, and testimony at this homicide court hearing strongly indicates the contrary, Mr. Thompson. And that will be all for now. <laughs> This way, please, Mr. Thompson. I'll uh, show you to your room. Thanks, Sergeant. Even set up a reservation. Here we are. Sorry, we have nothing with a view. How about a mattress? Mattress will be along. No mattress cover or bed sheets, though. Why not? Some of our guests have hanged themselves. <laughs> Wait. Uh, please listen. Believe me, somebody has to. I didn't kill that girl. I couldn't kill anybody. No one in here has ever been guilty. <laughs> no one's ever killed anybody. <laughs> but himself. Sure is weird. Oh, forget it. So what's next on the law and order program? Well, your case goes to the grand jury, and like I said, you better get yourself a lawyer. I can't. I told you that. I... I can't afford any lawyer. Well, then I hate to tell you this, but you'll be assigned a public defender, a second or maybe third-year law student hoping to learn something, maybe pick up some experience. And what you're getting is a born loser name of Al Mark. <laughs> Hi, Joe. How you feeling? You'd be Hal Mark. Right on. I've been assigned to your defense, uh... How are you holding up, Joe? I feel better in traction. I'm climbing the walls in here. You, you've got to get me out. Yeah. Well, um, Joe, we've got a problem. <laughs> no kidding. I've got the problem. I've never done anything wrong, and they want to kill me. Now, I know the facts, Joe. Believe me, I know. Uh, but I I'm not referring to the end, the uh, bottom line of this case. Our hurdle is big and immediate. The grand jury hearing's coming up in just a few days. Now, we aren't prepared. I uh, have here a copy of your homicide court proceeding. Now, I have slept with this report. I've turned it inside out, and it's a hang-up. If you were a doctor, I'd figure I had terminal cancer. I got a level with you. There's no evidence here in your favor. Nothing. You're supposed to find something. Well, you give me something to work with. Like what? I didn't kill Dorothy Logan. I wasn't there. That's I... it. You see, your word. That's all there is. We have to have some positive evidence, some some kind of alibi, witnesses. Uh, okay, like, um, maybe someone saw you changing that flat tire. Someone stopped to offer a hand. Anything. And there wasn't anybody. Nobody stopped. We're just driving around? Who knows? Did you, um, did you stop for gas somewhere? A, a filling station attempt? No, I didn't need any gas. Oh, boy. You know, I can see just one way out for you, Joe. Don't tell me. Plead guilty. What? When you go before the grand jury, plead guilty. Throw yourself on the mercy of the court. Mercy? What mercy? They want to kill me. I can't help you. I got nothing to work with. But you're supposed to be a lawyer. Well, I'm not a magician. So you're just going to let them electrocute me? I'm innocent. Can't you see? Can you understand that I'm innocent? Not anymore. What do you mean? Not anymore. I mean legally. That's the law, Joe. Remember it? Innocent until proven guilty. But I'm not really guilty. Well, where's the proof? Proof is nine points of the law. And on your side, Joe, you don't even have one point of proof. Now, well, I'll stick with you to the end. I'll try to dig something up, but... Oh, uh, spare me. I don't blame you for being uptight, I understand. <laughs> if I was in your shoes, I'd be shaking in them forever. But you're not getting rid of me. I'll be there at countdown. So stick around. Take notes while they cut me up and hope I last until your final exam. Hey, Officer Crow. Yes, sir. Yeah, what was the defendant's attitude on the night you questioned him at his apartment? Oh, his attitude was very hostile, very uncooperative. Mm -hmm. He resisted arrest. He, he insulted an officer. What officer? How? Oh, me, sir. He accused me of not telling the truth. Uh, you found uh, this raincoat and hat in his apartment, huh? Yes, I did. Well, have laboratory tests been conducted on his raincoat and hat? Yes, they have. Uh, what were the results of the analysis? Well, the mud found all over the raincoat and hat is identical with the mud found on the body of the murder victim, Dorothy Logan. 
There's no question. My memory has never failed me in 66 years, and I remember him being in the Shamrock drinking at my bar Saturday night. And you still remember when he left? About midnight. And you still remember when Dorothy Logan left? Huh? About the same time. Maybe a little before. I get a lot of customers on Saturday night. Yeah, and uh, when the accused left the Shamrock, you didn't see any mud on his coat and hat? Not that I remember. Helen Travis, uh, you said you were parked in Jonathan's Grove Saturday night or uh, early morning, a little after midnight? Yes, sir. I was parked in there with a friend. Mm-hmm. It was after midnight, but I'm not sure of the time. My friend and I were, you know, marveling at the sky, the stars all out. Mm -hmm. Such a pretty night for a while. Hey, well, uh, you describe what else you saw that night, Miss Travis. I mean, other than the constellations. I can't hardly even think about that horrible night, but... Okay, I'll try. Yeah, well, I thank you, Miss Travis. Hey, uh, please proceed. Well, we're parked, my friend and me admiring the heavens, when this beat-up old heap of a car drives in, parks just a ways from us, no more than 50 feet or so, and I couldn't be mistaken about what I'd seen. I mean, no way. The moon was full and bright and all those stars out. I mean, it was his, Mr. Thompson's car, all right. I'd know that old heap with a rubbed-out blue color anywhere. He didn't see us, I guess, on account of our car lights not being on, and we're parked in close alongside a mulberry hedge, but... I seen him clear enough. The way he came out of that car into the moonlight, dragging that poor girl, and the way she was screaming. And we were afraid to go over there and try to help or anything. I'm ashamed to say it, but we were afraid. But after he drove away, we went over there, and and she was dead. And all that blood. Well, why didn't you report this earlier, Miss Travis? Why wait until Monday to call the police? We were just too scared, I guess. Afraid to, you know, get involved. But it wouldn't leave us, uh, me, alone. I just kept thinking about that poor girl and what if it had been me? So I called the police, described the man I saw and his car... And his license number. How can we fight eyewitness testimony like that, Joe? You're supposed to find a way. Oh, can't you come up with something, anything, to show that you were someplace else? No way. How often does this happen to innocent people? I can't say. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to guess, Joe. I am telling you again. Your only chance to save your life is to plead guilty. Oh, no. Throw yourself on the mercy of the court. Hope for a second-degree verdict. You really think I'd do that? Admit being a murdering fiend when I, I've never hurt anybody. <laughs> You're hurting. You're hurting him, man. Let's 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 go. Go. Are you crazy? Are you cra is everybody crazy? Let's go. You want to kill me? Kill? No. You too? See? You do believe I'm guilty. You miserable shyster. Why not kill you too? Why not? I can only fry once. Isn't that the line? I can only fry once. Well, I am getting out of here. Crazy, man. You are crazy. Well, you may be right. Yeah. Could be. Joe, you have got nothing on your side. No witnesses, no alibi, no money. Look, I checked out the Travis dame. She's okay. A waitress at Al's diner. And that eyewitness account of hers is bad. Real bad. And you've got the whole judiciary system of this town against you. How's that? Well, it's corrupt. It's greedy. The DA is ambitious. He wants as many murder convictions as possible because he's going to run for state prosecutor. And what's more, the months of May, June, and July are called the lethal season. A lethal season? Yeah. More murders occur during hot summer months. Courts get overloaded with killers. They got to be cleared out as soon as possible. Yeah, could be it's me. Could be I've lost my marbles. You? Are you serious? Maybe she did see me kill that girl. And I don't remember because I'm some kind of split psycho. You mean a split personality? A schizo killer like Jekyll and Hyde? Oh. Hey. You mean it. You want me to cop an insanity plea? I... No. Wait. 
Well, what if I'm not crazy? Well, so what? You do a little time in a funny farm and go free. But it's bad enough already. Being guilty when I'm not, do I have to go crazy too? When maybe I'm no crazier than anybody else. Okay, it's your funeral. But I'd rather be crazy of anything than dead. If I'm not crazy, what is it? Do I have some fiendish double? Mm, possibly. But I have to be on my way. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. And if I didn't do it, who did? You're the only one who's going to worry about that. How long do I have to worry? Not long. What happens now? It's happened. You're indicted for first-degree murder. The worst criminals among us may become the object of hero worship. As a child, I was emotionally stirred by Billy the Kid and Jesse James. But how times have changed. I can't honestly think of a single present-day murderer I would care to identify with. I certainly wouldn't care to identify with Joe Thompson, whether he's a murderer, a convincing liar, or in fact is, as he insists that he is, an innocent victim. Which reminds me, is any victim entirely innocent? Perhaps we'll find at least some of the answer in Act Three. People still insist on reading newspapers and listening to the news. Most likely because they desperately need to be assured that something, somewhere, is happening to somebody. The misfortunes of others make us feel, by contrast, so much more fortunate than we really are. We can only hope that the ending of Joe Thompson's nightmare story of persecution does not disappoint you. So I'm found guilty of first-degree murder and put away to die, like a bug in a killing bottle. My only company was hopelessness and fear. I'd wondered if everyone else was right and that I might be crazy. Now I began to fear that I was going crazy in that isolated cell, waiting, knowing when and where and how I was to die, and knowing I was helpless to do anything about it. And one night, I woke in a cold sweat, thinking of a name, a name that might mean a last faint chance for salvation. Mr. Sam Ferris. Ferris? Yeah, he says he has an appointment to see you, Joe. Oh, yeah, Sam Ferris. Almost forgot. I... Here you are, Mr. Ferris. Make yourself at home. Uh, thank you, Sergeant. I prefer larger quarters. I didn't really think you'd come, Mr. Ferris. I wondered if you even got my letter or, or read it. Oh, I read it all right, but uh, before committing myself, I had to review your case. Uh, oh, uh, Sergeant, would you kindly excuse us? Oh, sure. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Ferris. Uh, take your time. Now, call out if you need anything. Uh, maybe you'd like some coffee? No, 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 no. Just some privacy. Oh, right, Mr. Ferris. <laughs> you got it. Here, Mr. Ferris, you, you, you want to sit down? Why not? First off, Mr. Ferris... Uh, Sam. I, I gotta say first that I'm innocent. Believe, I'm innocent. Like I said in my letter, I, I never... I couldn't have killed that girl. I've never been in Jonathan's Grove. Never heard of that girl or, or seen her before. You gotta believe me now. Say you believe me. Do that or it's off. No talk, no nothing. Forget it. No, no, just, just cool down, Joe. Just cool down. Now, how did, how did you get on to me? I dreamed about you. I mean, I read a magazine story about you once, and and I remembered in my sleep here, the lawyer of last resort, the man who goes to bat for the little guy who's been written off and doesn't have the chance of a moth in a blizzard. You've pulled off miracles in the courts. I figured you could pull off the biggest miracle of all time and help me. Well, no miracles, Joe. It's... Just evidence, facts, and uh, the right of every man to equal defense before the law. And I have never, never taken the case of a man who smelled guilty. You mean it? You figure me innocent? Well, I am here, Joe. You, you give me a chance? Oh, the prosecution has, Joe. Now, one look at the prosecution's case, and it is so full of holes you could use it for a fish net. <laughs> 
<laughs> you mean it? Easy, 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 Joe. You've been running in the rain too long. It's time to just dry off and just sit tight. I'm going to do a complete rundown on your case, uh, those so-called witnesses. Especially that gal, Helen Travis. Sam, where you been? I thought maybe something... Well, I've been losing sleep, Joe, losing sleep. But that DA is going to lose a lot more. How's my case look now? What case? (laughs) There just never was a case. So how come they figure they could kill me? No defense, Joe. No lawyer. Now, first off, they put most of their eggs in Helen Travis' eyewitness testimony. And nothing is so undependable and so unreliable in a court of law as an eyewitness. Any ten eyewitnesses will give you ten different versions of the same event. And nothing is easier to break down and discredit than an eyewitness. Now, what about the boyfriend she was parked with who was supposed to have seen you commit the murder most foul? That's right. Where was he? Well, it wasn't easy finding him. I saw Helen Travis. Now, she couldn't remember just which guy she was with. Now, one guy she named denied being with her at all, and the other joker said he hadn't seen anything because the night was pitch black. Now, I checked the weather bureau, and sure enough, that night the sky was black with clouds. No stars, as Travis said, no bright moonlight, no moon at all, so... That's why they didn't bring in the boyfriend to testify. So they couldn't have seen me. Couldn't have seen anything. I knew she was lying or crazy. Or drunk. Probably all three. And even if it had been a moonlit night, she she couldn't have told your car was blue because no one can distinguish at night any difference between green, blue, black, purple. Now, for Sharp, bartender. Yeah. What was his bag? Well, I saw him. He says he'd never testified definitely that he saw you leave the bar after the Logan girl. Now he isn't sure the exact time you left. He says he never was, never said he was. And it's the same with the Logan girl. And he says he never saw you with her at the bar. So, so much for Sharp. And now, now for the physical evidence. Yeah, the mud on my coat and hat. Mm Mm-hmm, that could have been picked up anywhere in the area. Now, I am talking about withheld evidence. You see, I checked at the headquarters. There were sneaker footprints all around the girl's body. And that foot that made them was patently larger than yours. Evidence never presented in court. And the crime lab had blood and hair samples, but didn't begin testing until the weekend before the hearing. By then, the original samples were too old to be properly tested. Now, the DA knew the sophisticated laboratory analysis might prove that the blood and hair belong to someone else, so just forget it. And uh, there's other evidence, all proving one thing, Joe. You have been a victim of gross injustice. Uh, No argument there, Sam. Well, I took my findings directly to Judge Winters. Uh, He read the statements and had them verified. He declared the Travis woman unworthy of belief. And he said the D.A. and all those responsible for your persecution are guilty of criminal negligence of a high order. So, you're a free man, Joe. Come on. I'll buy you a drink. So there, on the razor's edge between life and death, I found salvation. How many other innocents have been unjustly condemned? No one knows. I only know that I could be dead and buried in a dishonorable grave for a crime I could never have committed. I only know that eternal vigilance is still the price of liberty. My story as it appeared in the Morning Sun News, ended there. It was a sensation story. It also paid me $4,000. But there is more. Much more that I didn't tell. The story I share with one other person, Miss Helen Travis. I used to stop off at Al's Diner, where Helen had the early part of the night shift, waiting tables. Business 
slacked off after 11. I'd hang around. Helen would join me in a booth for coffee. Helen was about my age, bored, bitter. We were there in Al's diner Monday night. The Monday after Dorothy Logan was murdered. Refill, Joe? Thanks, Helen. And how was your evening? A uh, Texan was in here. So wealthy he didn't even know he had four kids in college. Or so he said. It hurt, but I laughed. And he tipped me a quarter. Well, what about you, Joe? No. Has a little man got any more big pipe dreams? Well, we can still rob a bank. Yeah, you can get yourself killed doing that. You know a better way? Joe. No, I'm tired out. Uh, so am I. Tired waiting for nothing to happen. Gotta make it happen. Tired reaching for the sky and getting it right in the teeth. I'm tired hating myself because I'm a bust. I just want to accept myself and live with it. We're not cut out to be gracious losers, honey. Gracious winners have more fun. <laughs> Pipe dreams. We're over the hill, Joe. It's finished. Maybe only the astronauts can have the moon. But we can shoot at it. We ought to make it a good ride anyway. Huh. Even if it's all downhill? Oh, everybody's on the toboggan ride. Hey, you're a funny cat. All hot air, but I like to listen to you yak. You almost make me believe all over again in the big bufola. Oh, they're out there grabbing it every day, Helen. Why not us? I just feel burned out. No. Wasted like an old rack at the thrift shop. Like, yeah, like that girl that was murdered Saturday night. Oh, another one? Don't you read the papers? Oh, who needs more bad news? Uh, here, it's all over the front page. Girl... Hung around at the Shamrock Bar, Dorothy Logan. Mm. Just a kid into the city looking for, you know, Lord knows what, one of our dreams. The brass ring you're always yakking about. So what did she get? Murdered. In the mud. Squashed like a bug. Wasted. The only difference between her and me is it's taken me longer. Ah, oh, that girl, that night, Joe. Gives me the creeps. Oh, why the creeps? It happens every night. Not right in front of your eyes. What? I was there where it happened. When it happened. I was so bored Saturday night, I took a ride with an old boyfriend. If you saw him, you'd know how really bored I was. Anyway, he parked in Jonathan's Grove. That girl was killed a few yards away. I know the spot. And about the same time we was there. But you didn't see or hear anything? Oh, no. Yes, you did, Helen. You saw and heard it all. No, it was dark. No, I... no, it wasn't dark. You saw it, honey. You saw the killer's car. You remember the license plate. And you know the killer. I do? Yeah. You're looking at him. Hey, you sure could have fooled me. I figured your limit was pulling wings off butterflies. No, no. I mean, that's what you're going to phone up the cops right now and tell them. You're going to describe me, my car, give them the license plate, and, and tell them you saw me murder Dorothy Logan. Hey, sorry, Joe, but you're gone. Gone round the hill. You just gave me the idea. The big one, Helen. The first and last big one of our life, honey. Because if they're big enough, one is all you'll ever need. Now, now listen. And, and, and do what I tell you. And all you have to do is stick to your story. And when it's over, we cash in. <laughs> Helen, and don't say anything. Just listen. We have to be careful about seeing or talking with one another for a while. It's called collusion. I'm sending you some money and a plane ticket to Acapulco. I've set up reservations for us at the Hacienda del Lobo. I'll see you there next Saturday night. Joe, you wouldn't kid me. I never did. Haven't we got more walking around money than we ever had in the bank? Boy, it was a nightmare. I wouldn't go through that again for the key to Fort Knox. <laughs> Who needs Fort Knox? What happened? Sam Ferris and I sued the city. 
charged that I was subjected to false arrest, unlawful imprisonment, illegal search and seizure, malicious persecution, loss of job, damaged reputation, cruel and unusual punishment, mental torture, and you name it. What did all that add up to? Two million bucks, honey. Oh. And the golden bacon. Hey, you okay? I, uh, I feel dizzy. That's not dizzy, Helen. That's flying. Here, drink this. You look a lot younger, especially when you smile. (laughs) You know, Joe, when I first saw you flaked out in Al's diner, I figured you had about as much life in you as a window dummy and weren't nearly as handsome. I've changed. You're beautiful, Joe Thompson. Just beautiful. It's wholesome and American for a criminal to want to rise in the world. To want to get on to bigger, if not always better things. However, I hope this success story doesn't inspire you to do likewise. I'm not even sure to what degree our hero is a criminal. If so, he managed to carry out a crime that was somehow rendered legal by the illegality of the law. I shall return shortly. Money. In large quantities, it is frequently appealing. For this very reason, long sentences have been designed for grand larceny. Money persists in being a problem. They say it isn't everything, that it's the root of all evil. Then there are those who consider it eminently worthwhile, or who at least feel that they deserve the chance to decide for themselves, whatever the risk. I should like to look in on Joe and Helen Thompson one day, and perhaps find out if it was worth the cost. Our cast included John Lithgow, Russell Horton, Terry Keane, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy. YouTube 